Hello. There was once a wonderful guru who turned up in a town and said he knows the secret of how to have a happy life. People came from far and near and assembled in a town square to hear him talk. And it all went quiet and the guru said, do you know what I'm going to teach you today? No, said everybody. We haven't a clue. We don't know, said a little voice from the back of the crowd. If you know nothing, said the guru, there's nothing for me to teach you. And off he went again. Seven years later, the same guru came back. The same people in the same town square. The same question. Do you know what I'm going to teach you today? Oh, yes, yes, we've talked about it. We've, uh, we, we know all about it, said a little voice at the back. If you know all about it, said the guru, there's nothing for me to teach you. So off he went again. Seven years later, the same guru, the same crowd, the same Times Square, the same question. Do you know what I'm going to teach you today? Some of us think we do. And some of us think we don't, said the little voice at the back. Well, said the guru, let those who think they know tell those who think they don't. And with that, he went away again. Now, if we take this story and think about the fo change the focus from being how to have a happy life to how to be a brilliant actor, the conclusion of let those who think they know tell those who think they don't becomes quite contentious. Because we like our gurus in actor training. After all, we want to know what they know and do what they do. And we give our gurus total authority. The sort of authority that only comes with absolute certainty. You can't move for gurus in acting. Konstantin Stanislavski, Lee Strasberg, Stanford Meisner, Uta Hagen, Stella Adler, Michael Chekhov, Jacques Capot, Jacques Lecoq. Towering figures all, and they're all dead. In life, they were inspiring. Their work was constantly developing, constantly getting wider and deeper and moving on. But death brought an end to all that. And dead gurus breed disciples. And disciples spread the gospel. And disciples know the rules. And disciples know the difference between right and wrong. But in art, there is no right and wrong. There are differences. Differences are interesting. Differences are creative. Rules are only there to make things happen. If we don't like what's happening, we change the rules. After all, we're not dealing with natural laws here. This isn't physics. The only rule of theatre is don't be boring. Everything else is negotiable. <laughs> when I was a drama student, far too many decades away to go into now, uh, the first project I remember as asked, being asked to do was to make a play that could tour around local primary schools at Christmas time. It must have been our second or third gig. I remember, and a friendly teacher took pity on the fact that we were using tiny handheld mirrors to put on complicated makeup. And the teacher said, in a classroom on the other side of a school, there's a full length mirror. So I went to get it. And when I arrived in that classroom, it was like landing on Mars. There was a row of 
of tables on one side, and on the tables were large papier-mâché heads with elaborate paper hairstyles and instantly recognisable faces. I don't think the kids had done it entirely on their own. But I could recognise grumpy old men, world-weary women, cheeky little school kids, bored adolescents, and a man in a paint-stained overall with hands completely covered with pink paint indicated a mirror. And there, across the room, in front of the mirror, a show was going on. Two kids were playing two of the masks. And everyone was falling about at the antics of this little girl in a big head with enormous bunches, one slightly higher than the other, who was walking around the stage with one shoe on and one shoe off. They loved it. Her other shoe was in the hands of the most terrifying mother you could imagine. She had a shock of black hair and a face that looked as if it was designed to scream. She kept slamming, suddenly, in a fit of rage, she was slamming this shoe over and over again on a table. You could hear a pin drop in the audience. Then they erupted like a football crowd. Meanwhile, bunchy girls stood their weight on one hip. The epitome of insolence walked across the room, took her school bag and emptied the contents right in the middle of the floor. Another pin drop moment. Then another explosion of delight. Now there was a standoff, mum and daughter. Mum pointed suddenly and in the middle of the pile of rubbish, a badly wrapped greaseproof paper parcel gradually unraveled itself to reveal a squashed tomato sandwich. The show was over. I got my mirror, and as I pushed it back towards our makeshift dressing room, it occurred to me that those kids were better than us. We were so complacent. We learnt the rules, you see. And now we were so cleverly applying them, we thought it was going brilliantly. Those kids didn't know there were any rules. They were having the time of their lives. They'd taken comedy and drama and done that. We didn't do that at drama school. Next to them, we were boring. Next to them, we were having about as much fun as a family at a funeral. I went back to my colleagues and told them about my trip to Mars, and they were quite dismissive. They're kids, playing, that's what kids do. Ask them to do that scene night after night, and we'll soon see how good they are at acting. But they hadn't seen the masks. If you get a large papier-mâché head and put it on a small eight-year-old body. It looks grotesque. It's like something from ancient Rome. But if you recognize the face, and if you understand the situation the mask is in, you start to empathize with this preposterous thing. I left that classroom convinced that these heads had transformed those kids. Well, my colleagues weren't terribly interested in that because they hadn't seen them. And there's something really interesting about masks because masks have remained the simplest and the most sophisticated means of inspiring interactive play since the Stone Age. Put your hands like this and just look through the hole you've made. Now, look at the person next to you. Really look at them. Have a good look. Look in their faces. Look at their erogenous zones. You won't get pregnant. <laughs> now, move your hands away. Behind your hands, you get the feeling that you're not there. You feel completely separate. Then you're back. <laughs> you can't know what I'm thinking. You're back. 
this is what happens in a mask. But something else happens because on the inside, when you think you're not there, on the outside, we're negotiating a face. And the first time you encounter a mask is a bit like bumping into a stranger in the dark. You want to know, who is this person? What does this person want? What are they thinking? These are instant, instant reactions, instant thoughts that pop into your head. It's a survival mechanism. But on the inside, looking out through here, you look out and you see... And in the audience, you see rows of faces all reacting to you. And you haven't done anything. You can't take any credit for what's happening. And when this happens, the telling self, that little voice at the back of our minds that knows all the rules and will tell you exactly how well you're doing, suddenly has nothing to say. And up pops the doing self. Now, the doing self is that impulsive part of us that makes you want to slam a shoe on a table or empty the contents of your school bag out in the middle of the room. The doing self, when the doing self is in the driving seat, we start to play. Now, there's a complicated little word. If you look at play in the new shorter Oxford English Dictionary, you'll see several inches of column space devoted to its various definitions. I use play in the sense you might say, moonlight is playing on a pool of water. On the one hand, it's fascinating. It's beautiful. But on the other, it's fatuous and meaningless. That's the problem. We want our meaning. We've all been to school to learn to value meaning over everything else. But playfulness is the kernel of our creativity. And play precludes meaning. After all, you can't have your cake and eat it. If I have ever had an epiphany moment, then those kids in their big balloon-shaped heads were it. They enabled me to rediscover the playfulness that first attracted me to making theatre. They also gave me a taste for getting other people to do much the same. As the great guru said, let those who think they know tell those who think they don't. Thank you for listening.